It is great to be with you this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made and it is great. So excited to be with you this morning that I even washed my hair last night. I woke up this morning with it sticking up looking a bit like Einstein. Had to wet it down, look a bit normal. And yes, I, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Hugh, you don't have nearly as much hair as Einstein. But I feel like I looked like Einstein. I brushed my teeth, I had a shave, I'm not wearing my pajamas. It is a great day. As I was preparing for this morning, I had a picture of the spring behind me. For those that don't know where we stay, the spring gives us water to our family. It comes out the rock, pure, fresh, cold. We dam it, we pipe it down to a tank, we pipe it to the house, and we use it. And even though we use it, it doesn't stop flowing, and it's more than enough. As it fills the dam, it goes over the weir there, it flows down into to our, one of our dams, into another dam, out of our property, into someone else's dam, into another river below that, flows into, into the Lions River, into Midmar, and quite possibly some of this water has ended up in your homes and you've drunk our spring water. And this lovely picture of the Holy Spirit that comes from the rock, that He's not just for us. Yes, we take our fill and we're refreshed by Him. But the Holy Spirit is there for everyone else. That we can go and bless others. And I encourage you over this time to make use of the Holy Spirit. Get your refreshing, your guidance from Him. But use Him to bless others. Just encourage you this morning. As we go into a time of worship, I encourage you to stand and worship Him. Or sit. Or stand. It's great. Let's worship together. How's it, HCF? I went to church. I uh, hope you're all doing well and you, you guys are all safe at home. Um, yeah, my brother and I are doing worship uh, for you guys for Sunday morning. I need to keep that in mind. Um, but just before we go into worship, I want to read this verse. It says, O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. And let's do that. Let's really just lift Him high and let's do what we were made to do. And that's from Psalm 95, verse 6. So let's go into a time of worship.
that was great. It's great to be able to worship together. Even though we're doing it remotely, we are worshiping the King. And yes, I know I'm using the word great a lot. But He is great. It is great to be together. Let's move into a time of breaking of bread. And I, I, I yes, I know we, we're doing it a little more often than we used to. It used to be once a month, at the end of the month, like clockwork. Now we're doing it every week. But there's no stipulation of how often or we should be doing this. And I encourage you, if you want to do it more often, to do it with your families. Because it is fantastic. See, I didn't use the word great. <laughs> Improving drastically. We're saying, well, why do we do this breaking of bread? And obviously Jesus says we must do it in remembrance of him. But what is the big picture? And for me, it's celebrating or it's remembering that point in history where all we had was that road to destruction. Jesus came and he died and he's given us another option. It's to follow him on that road to eternal life. For you and me, we have come to that junction and we have chosen eternal life. And it's, it's a blessing. It's amazing. But on this journey towards Jesus, sometimes we get distracted. Things come up and they, they worry us. and they, they take our eyes off Jesus. By remembering Jesus, we, we're going back. And we're remembering what it was like at that point. Where we were going to destruction. And now we are going to eternal life. It's to focus once again on Jesus. Ignore the issues around us. And say, this is all that matters. And I encourage you as a family, if you haven't got it ready to go get it ready, press pause. This is live TV, but you can pause this. Pick it up again when you when you when you've done it, broken bread together. But but really celebrate that turning point in your lives. Celebrate the selfless act. Jesus died on the cross. So that his body and his blood has set us free, has cleansed us, has healed us. And that nothing else matters. That journey of him and the way that he's marked out for us is all that matters now. Um, and I, I was reading through Philippians and that, that famous quote from Paul, to live as Christ, to die as gain. And I just want to read that passage to us. From Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 to something else. For to me, to live as Christ and to die as gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which shall I choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. And I think for us in our lives, is to be with Jesus. That, that is amazing. That is what we are longing for. But while we are on earth, God has another plan for us. It's, another, it's a path. He is the way. It's following Him. And while we are on that path, it's doing what He wants us to do. Maybe it's going to the nations. Maybe it's telling your neighbor about Jesus. Maybe it's just taking the Holy Spirit out with you where you go and blessing people with that. That is God's heart while we are on earth. Yes, it would be better to be with Him in, in heaven. But while we're here, we need to focus on what God's plan is for us. Shall we pray? Father God, thank you for that the cross, Lord. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for that self, selfless act where you, you obeyed your Father and you thought about us, that we can once more be reunited with God. Lord, and as we walk this path of following you in the difficulties of this age, Lord, help us keep our eyes back, back on you. Lord. Keep our eyes on you, that the things of this world would not would not sway us. As we remember you this morning, Lord, that we focus once again on you and the amazing gifts that you've given us, that we would just swing our eyes back to you as we, as we walk our road for you. Lord, and we walk in the plans and the purposes of what you've got for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, guys. We move into announcements and a doctor's update in the word. God bless you guys. I love you. Hi, good morning everyone. Lovely to be able to connect with you again and uh, speak a bit about the virus and the pandemic that we're experiencing at the moment. When you hear this, it'll already be three days into level four 
and uh, hopefully you're all doing well. Um, in terms of what we've been seeing, once again, amazed at how we've been able to keep that curve down, to flatten the curve as the expression goes. And the world is applauding South Africa for the efforts that they have done. And I think we can be incredibly grateful for it. Because I know many of us have questioned, was it really worthwhile? Did we achieve it? You know, is this real? Because the numbers have been so low. And um, certainly from a medical point of view, I can say we're incredibly grateful for everyone for doing what they have done to keep this under control. Because when we look at the big five countries, the USA, the UK, Spain, Italy, France, it's uh, certainly been a different picture completely. And uh, I'm so grateful that up to now we've been able to keep the levels down as much as we can. However, I also realize that um, as the Wealth World Health Organization say, that health is not just the absence of disease, that this um, shutdown has also had a huge impact that we're going to feel for months and years to come in other areas. You know, we are... Um, not just physical beings, but uh, the whole biopsychosocial, spiritual impact of this is going to be affect, uh, affect us for many years to come. But, you know, just to say to you that uh, do not become complacent, but please to remember to continue to wear masks when you're outside, to practice social distancing, to wash your hands um, regularly, and um, just to restrict your movement. Um, and contact with others as hard as it is and as much as we'd like to get back to normality you know the bible says that we mustn't become weary in doing good and so i'd encourage you from that aspect don't become tired of what we're doing because it is going to have a huge impact going into the future but bless you keep strong keep yourself full of hope as we go to this next phase bless you Morning, everybody. It's wonderful to be with you this morning. This morning, we begin a new series through uh, the first nine chapters of Acts. And today, we're going to look at Acts chapter 1. And so starting off in verse 1, uh, Luke writes, in, the first, in my first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. In the first book, O Theophilus, Acts was written by Luke. Uh, the good doctor, writing to some uh, high up, well-respected individual, Theophilus. And some have had a guess that it might have been written as a defense for Paul's trial in Rome. Uh, perhaps because it starts out with a chronological account of Jesus' birth to his resurrection in the Gospel of Luke, and now picks up in, in Acts with the ascension of Christ and the growing momentum of the Gospel uh, as a, a takes ground around the world, the known world, as well as the growing persecution of the church. And in chapter 9, we see Paul is saved, his conversion, and then the story follows Paul's life to the point of him being taken to, the Rome, to Rome at the end of Acts. But whatever the reason for which it was written, what we have is an account of the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Not so much the Acts of the Apostles as it's written in your Bible. Uh, many of these things were not done by the apostles. This was the work of God. This, this book gives us an incredible account of the power, the presence, and authority of normal kingdom life. Um, and he writes, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach. 
Luke implies that Jesus' whole life on earth was only the beginning. Acts is Jesus continuing what he began to do and teach through his church by the power of his Holy Spirit, continuing in his doing and his teaching. The kingdom is not just a matter of talk but of power, Paul wrote. The early church uh, was warned of those who held a form of Christianity but denied its power. The power, presence, and authority of God are a normal part of church life, kingdom life, and something that we need today. Um, Jesus did not simply teach. He began to do. He acted. He lived his message. He is truth, and he teaches. You know, There's a terrible saying that those who can't do teach. This is not kingdom. Jesus did it first. He lived his message. He healed. He forgave. He loved. He provided. He lived a life and he taught us how to do the same. There is a saying. It's also popular and I won't quote the person. But the saying goes, preach the gospel and if you have to, use words. It's a great saying uh, for somebody who is saying the right things but not living the right things. Not living the life. But it's not actually 100% correct because Jesus lived and taught. In the New Testament, we learn that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. We've got to live it, but we also got to speak it out as well. We've got to preach the gospel. We've got to share the hope we have. We've got to break the sound barrier. So I ask a question now. What is it that Jesus is still doing and teaching? Well, friends, he's preparing his bride for the wonderful day of his return. He is saving people from their sin. He's sanctifying them or preparing them for life with him, eternity with him. Pick up in verse 2, until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And verse 3, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. We learn a little bit about what he was talking uh, in these 40 days from reading the end of the Gospels. He met a couple of disciples on the road to Emmaus and, and, he, and he unlocked scripture, all the Old Testament, everything point concerning himself. He pointed out to them. Jesus came through locked doors and appeared to disciples in that room. And he ate fish with them, proving he was alive, proving he was real, not just a ghost like they thought he was on a few occasions before. And he, was told, he also told them to meet him in Galilee. And there he made a fish bra for them on the beach. And he helped them with an incredible catch as well as um, just calling Peter again, recalling, re uh, confirming Peter's call after Peter denied him. And he was speaking about the kingdom of God. What was Jesus speaking about? What should we be speaking about? Friends, the kingdom. There's no subject for a believer that falls outside the scope of the kingdom, whether we're talking about finances. How to get through a financial crisis with your business, with your family. How to look after your staff, how to serve your boss, how to raise your children, how to homeschool them during this crisis. Whatever subject you can think of, the followers of Christ, this happens within the context of the kingdom of God. We get to navigate all these different areas through this truth that we are kingdom subjects of another kingdom and this kingdom has a king his name is jesus and we are his servants i mean we can look at the three c's on how to look after your finance or the 21 tips on how to have a better marriage but for a believer it's not about tips and tricks none of these are, are true outside the context of us obeying the king and realizing that we hand everything over to him and that's when his life flows different rules apply the king does not make suggestions about what we should do in his kingdom or with his kingdom. If our family businesses or our school life or our thought life, our love life, any part of our lives gets to enjoy the benefit of being part of his kingdom, it is only on these terms that he is king. Not cash, not me, not about my pleasure. He is king. Jesus is king. And, and submission to him, that's where life flows. I am his servant, his bond servant. I do what he says. I obey him. And boy, that's when there is life. That's when different rules apply. The kingdom rules apply. That's where five loaves and three fish are enough to feed potentially 20,000 people. That's where one jar of oil can last for months of daily use. The flow can carry on indefinitely. 
This is the place where the blind can see, the lame can walk, the barren embrace their children, the weak are made strong, the poor are rich. David beats Goliath. Battles are won by worshiping God. That's the kingdom. And that's what we God in, uh, intended for us all to live. But it's only on terms where we take him as our king, where we surrender everything to him. Jesus spoke on the kingdom for 40 days. This is what we should be talking about. This is what we are talking about. Verse 5, uh, 45. While staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Go to Jerusalem and don't leave, but wait for the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father. This is what the Father had been speaking about uh, through the Old Testament. He used to come upon different people at different times, his Holy Spirit, to complete specific tasks. We see all through the Old Testament. Uh, some of them, his Holy Spirit came on them. They could do artistic work, um, just a different dimension to their work. We, you know, we think of guys like Elijah, Samson, David, Joseph, Moses, Gideon. Holy Spirit came on them, and they, and they did incredible things to the glory of God. All of them quite different. All of us are called to be filled with the Spirit. Um, Samson broke free from chains through the power of the Holy Spirit. Friends, the, the Holy Spirit has power to be set free from addictions, from chains that have been holding us. Even for years, when the Spirit of God comes, He wants to set us free. He comes to give us strength, to, to lead the kind of lives that deep down we all longing to lead. You know, in the Old Testament, we see that the Holy Spirit came not on everybody, but on particular people for a specific task. And uh, this kind of goes on, the momentum growing, the expectation rising, and, and through different places, the prophet's talking about the promise of the Father. Um, Jeremiah, God promised to place his law not on tablets of stone, but, but on our hearts. It was promised by the Father, Ezekiel chapter 36, 26 to 27. He said, I'll put my spirit on you, and I'll move you to follow my decrees. Holy Spirit, this was always God's plan to give us his Holy Spirit. And this is what Jesus tells him to wait for. And um, in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 29, God spoke through the prophet Joel and, and he said, Afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy regardless of gender, old, young, maid servants, men servants, rich, poor, it doesn't matter, on all kinds of people, not just on specific special people, but on anyone and everyone. There's an invitation to all of us to be filled with his Holy Spirit. Young people, old people, on all people, on all flesh. Yet this promise remained unfulfilled through the Old Testament, and they waited hundreds and hundreds of years. And we see kind of a momentum building as Jesus arrives. We hear more talk of the Holy Spirit, and John recognized that's Jesus who's going to be baptizing us with the Holy Spirit. John is the first one to make the link with the promise and Jesus. He says, I baptize you with water, but the one more powerful than I, he will come and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He's going to baptize, he's going to drench you. It's like a ship being sunk, overwhelmed by the water. The water's around it, it's in it, it gets inside of all of it, and eventually it just sinks in this huge body of water. That's what God wants to do with his Holy Spirit, with his, his power, his love, the assurance that we are children of God. He just wants to overwhelm us with himself, with his Holy Spirit. Jesus was himself completely filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came on him and remained on him, uh, the Bible tells us. And Jesus predicts the coming of the Spirit, John chapter 4. Jesus says in John chapter 7, verse 37 to 38, Whoever is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Friends, we all have a thirst. We all have the spiritual thirst inside of us because we, we were created for God's Spirit. And it's only through the cross and only through salvation and, that God can accept us and, and, and fill us with the Spirit. And there can be this living water flowing from inside of us. God wants to flood you with his Holy Spirit. That's what we see uh, in, in Acts chapter 1. He says, wait in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. I'm going to fill you with my Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, which we're going to get to uh, next week, next Sunday morning, we hear the suddenly, 
the sound of a violent wind and the Holy Spirit came upon them and everything changed from that moment. The promise of the Father was now available, fulfilled, and he's now still available, which is just incredible. Repent and be baptized so that you may have the gift of the Father. He's the Spirit of Christ. He's the Spirit of Jesus. And so Jesus tells them, go and wait for the promise. Wait for the promise of the Father. And so verses uh, 6 to 8 so when they had come together and they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, everything had changed at that, at that time. You know, Jesus had died. He'd risen again. The life that got used to it all kind of changed. And they knew it was about to change as Jesus was heading back. Kind of like now. They'd been used to big open meetings. Sometimes about 20,000 people, the experts would guess. But now they were in small groups, just hiding out on boats and in upper rooms and and remember, he's just, Jesus had just been murdered. I mean, he's alive, but there was a very real danger. They didn't know where it was all going from here. And so they're asking these questions. Lord, isn't it time? Can you just take us home now? Can you, can you just finish this all off? Can you just come and fetch us now? Can we go home? Is, is, can we? And Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. It's coming. It's a fixed day. The Father knows it. He knows the day. He's fixed the day already by his own authority. But this is not your concern right now. Trust the Father. Trust that he's got it. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Friends, there is a job that is still to be completed. It's the job for the church. Matthew 24, 14. And Jesus says to them when he's talking about the end, when will we know it's the end? And he says, this good news of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Friends, in many ways, we see uh, churches, sometimes their attitude deficient these days when it comes to this commission that Jesus gave the church. You know, God is love. Surely uh, he won't send people to hell if they don't know him. And, you know, we hear these stories of Jesus revealing himself to people in dreams. Friends, I think we're missing something if we just think, let Jesus do that. Because that's what he called us to do. Hudson Taylor started the inland mission to China because he was overwhelmed with the compassion for generation after generation of Chinese people heading to a godless eternity because they'd not heard the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. They are still... Millions of people who have not heard the name of Jesus. Friends, there's still a job to do. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Mark 16, we go into all the world and we proclaim the gospel to the whole creation, all humanity, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, and they will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Friends, it's too big for us. This job is too big. We cannot do it. Don't try this at home. We need his Holy Spirit. Jesus said, it's too big and dangerous for you. But when I fill you with my power, my spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, my anointing, boy, oh boy, then you will go and you will boldly proclaim the gospel. You'll be just bubbling with the goodness of God, the joy, the life of God, and these signs will accompany those who believe. Friends, we need to believe. We will be his witnesses. The power of the Holy Spirit will give us boldness and authority to be his witnesses. 
This is the spirit of sonship he talks about, the boldness by which we cry, Abba, Father. That we know that we are children of God, obedience, and therefore, with all the all authority of heaven backing us, as if God himself was speaking. I remember uh, my little sister once coming and telling me not to jump on the back of, um, you know, that cover over the back of the bucky. It was a bit like a trampoline. And I didn't take her words too seriously, unfortunately. Uh, I failed to recognize the command and the authority um, of my father in her tiny little voice. But boy, he soon made up for that. And uh, soon enough, far too soon, in fact. And uh, I learned a lesson there. Friends, when we are as witnesses in the power of the Spirit and obedience to his call, we move in his authority. Like my little sister there, by being obedient to my dad, she actually carried his authority. And when we're obedient and we do what he's called us to, there's protection, there's provision, there is the pleasure and delight of the Father. We need to line up our lives with what he is doing. Friends, it's the greatest adventure out. Verse 9, And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, Behold, two men, two angels uh, in white robes said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you saw him go into heaven. Why are you looking up? I wonder how long they were standing there. I wonder how long they would have stayed there if God didn't send two servants to get them on the move up. You know, thinking maybe he'll come back. I was just reading the story of Elijah and Elisha where Elijah was taken up. And the sons of prophets, prophets went <laughs> looking all around, looking for him. And uh, like God needed to send the angels say, stop looking for him. He will come again. You know, when God does something incredible, we can make it a monument. We can just stay there. We can just, you know, he kind of needs to jolt us out of that. Yes, he did come through for us. He did these amazing, amazing things. But he's going to do more amazing things. Let's get on with what he said. Let's get on with being faithful, with serving, with being obedient and doing the unspectacular. Doing what nobody sees, um, you know, sticking line and length to the basics of what he's told us to do. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says, For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, we will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Jesus is coming back again, friends. He is coming again. We should live uh, with that in mind. Verse 12 to 14. And then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All of these with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. This is a great point. They were in full agreement. They were devoted to prayer, fasting and waiting for God's power. Friends, I encourage us. Be devoted to prayer. Let's be devoted to waiting on God for his power, for his life. Friends, I don't know how to emphasize this enough. My, my life. It's at its best with the Lord Jesus when I'm in constant times of prayer, when I'm, I'm having good times of prayer. My life moves forward. The, the next door gets opened when I'm spending time aligning myself in prayer. It's just, it's the best. I want to encourage you, take time aside, steal time away just to go and talk to him and to pray. At first it might seem awkward, but before you know it, it'll be, it'll be the best part of your day. I encourage you, friend. Let's Let's be devoted to prayer. Let's be devoted to praying together. We see the early church were devoted to praying together. On Tuesday nights, we pray. At the moment, we pray on Zoom, if you can make it on Zoom. But we also have an online prayer meeting, which a little video goes up. And some prayer pointers, one of us, one of the elders or one of the leaders will give. 
And then you can press pause, you can pray a bit, and then you can press play and you can carry on. I encourage you, join. Uh, the, this is for the whole church, that we are a praying church, devoted to prayer. When we're devoted to prayer, that's when we're going to see God move. That's when we're going to see His power, His Holy Spirit flow through our lives. When we are um, dependent on Him, prayer says, Lord, we cannot do this alone. We need you. We need your power. We need your spirit. And when we're in those times of prayer, when we're devoted to prayer on our own, and we're devoted to prayer as a family and devoted to prayer as a church, that's when we're going to see the life of God flow. And God is wanting to do amazing things in this time. He's wanting to use people. People who will make themselves available and, and prayer being devoted to prayer is one of those things of saying Lord here I am I, I'm available use me God I'm available what do you want to do with me I'm in your kingdom you're my king what do you want to say to me what do you want to do Lord what do you want to do in that situation you know I just take time aside Lord what do, you, what do you think we should do there and then you know sometimes an idea comes and I quickly write it down you know hey sometimes it might be me Gee, sometimes I look back and I go, wow, that was a little bit too clever to be me. And you know, when you get one or two things that are a little bit too clever to be you, then you start to go, wow, I'm really meeting with the Lord, you know, and just His love and His presence. And uh, man, encourage us. Let's be a church of prayer. And verse 15 to 26, in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. And he said, uh, verse 16, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guard to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called, in their own language, Akaldama. Not sure how to say that, which is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it. And so he picks up in the Psalms, and, and, and Peter reads, Let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when Jesus was taken up from us. One of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, uh, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and they said, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen. Friends, we don't get to choose leadership. The Lord chooses leadership. And verse 25, uh, who you've chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go into his own place. And they cast lots for them and the lot fell on Matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Friends, we, we're also in that preparation phase. Here we see before the Holy Spirit was poured out and, and they kind of locked down in chapter 2, which we'll look at next week, there was a preparation, a, a getting our house in order, getting leadership in place, training, preparing, making adjustments for what God was about to do. Friends, I would encourage you, would you be that kind of lever, leader, that servant, that slave of Christ, the kind of servant he can use, his kind of leader. Someone who's obedient to him, someone who's looking to him, someone he can use. Would you make the adjustment in your life and say, Lord, I'm available. I mean, leadership is not anything special in terms of the kingdom. It's normally the guy who's just said, Lord, what do you want to do with me? I'm available. And friends, we're in a preparation uh, time. I think even like in Acts chapter 1, where with what God's about to do, through the church and in the church and, and for his kingdom around the planet. We need to be prepared. We need to be saying, Lord, I'm going to make the adjustments in my life where there's been uh, stuff that's getting in the way of you being able to use me. I want to, I want to get rid of that. I want to deal with this. I want to prepare. Lord, I'm available. Do what you want with me. Here I am if you want to use me. Submit it in to him as your king. Submit it into the leadership he's put in place in your life and being available. There's a time to run. You know, I was reading 1 Kings 18. 
and talks about the big showdown that takes place with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And, it, and it's incredible at the end where it talks about, I'm about to send my rain. And Elijah ran faster than the chariots. He ran faster than the horses. Um, supernatural power of God. But I believe there's a rain coming and we're going to have to run. Friends, it's time to prepare. It's time to listen to what the Holy Spirit's saying. What has He called you? What has He spoken over your life? What is He doing with you? Because friends, it's time to just say, yes, Lord. Amen. Amen means we agree. Okay, Lord, not my plans. This is your kingdom. We want to see your life. We want to see your provision, your security, your blessing. But Lord, you're the king of this kingdom. We want to see the kingdom rules apply to our lives, but we surrender to you. What do you want to do with me? My business, my family, my life, my thoughts, my, my everything. I surrender. And so friends, I just want to encourage you. If that's you now. I'm saying, Lord, I'm available. I'm available. Here I am. Would you use me? Would you fill me? Do what you want with me. I surrender my all to you. Why don't you respond in prayer now? Let me, let me pray for you. Lord, just commit everybody who you're touching right now, who you're setting apart, as your Holy Spirit touches their hearts right now, and you're calling them and you're setting them apart for something that perhaps they've known for a long time. For some of them, it's kind of the first time that they, they're knowing what you call them to. For some of them, they don't know what you call, but they're just saying we're available. Lord, wherever we are at, would you meet us there? Would you prepare us for this next season? Would you use us and would you flood us with your Holy Spirit, we ask. In your beautiful name, amen. We love you, Jesus. Friends, if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus, why don't you pray at this prayer with me, after me. And if you would like to give your life to Christ, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Be Lord of my life. Be King of my life. I submit to you as my King, as my Lord. And I reach out to you as my Savior. Thank you for taking my punishment on the cross, taking my sin and shame, and offering me life and a place in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, friends. Thank you so much. Uh, for joining us this morning, just sending loads of love uh, from our home to yours and can't wait to see you soon. We're praying for all of you. Amen. Bye-bye. One, two, three, four.
shine.